Hello and welcome to this model on how to interpret the M plus output file for a structural equation model. My name is Christian Geiser. On this channel I present weekly statistics tutorials usually related to structural equation modeling, factor analysis, multi-level analysis or latent class analysis and often involving applications in the M plus software. If this is something that interests you then please subscribe to this channel. Also, don't forget to hit the like button and to check out the description for additional resources, including a link to my free weekly newsletter, as well as other videos and workshops. In this video here, I want to discuss the output file for a simple structural equation model for which I discussed the syntax in a previous video. You find a link to this previous video in the description below for uh, the current video. And so if you are not familiar with the M plus syntax yet, then please check out that other video first. In this video here, I'm gonna focus on the M plus output. You can see that this is a simple structural equation model where I have two factors, F1 and F2. Each factor has two indicators. The indicators or observed variables Y1 and Y2 measure factor F1 and the indicators Y3 and Y4 are indicators of the factor F2 and then the factor F2 is regressed on the factor F1. So there's a latent regression model here where F1 predicts the factor F2. So let's run this model and see what we get in the M plus output file. And I will give you the highlights of what M plus provides us. For this model. So first of all, when we run a model in M plus and everything goes well, we get a summary of our input instructions or a copy of those syntax instructions that we gave so that if we print out our output file that all the syntax commands will be also on that output file so we can always check whether the model that we specified was the model that we wanted to specify, for example. And then after the syntax is reproduced, M plus will hopefully provide the message input reading terminated normally. So that indicates that there were no um, syntax errors or no other basic errors in our model specification. So this is a good sign. And then we can, under the summary of analysis, determine the number of observations. In this case, the sample size was 500 cases. It's always good to check that that also matches with your expectations. And the model here had four dependent variables, namely the observed indicator variables of the two factors F1 and F2. And those factors F1 and F2 are our two continuous latent variables. The labels of all variables are then also provided so that you can check that you use the correct indicator variables here, Y1, Y2, Y3, and Y4 are our, our observed dependent variables and by default they are seen as continuous in M plus and then also the latent variables are continuous and those uh, were labeled F1 and F2. When you have continuous indicator variables in factor analysis and structural equation modeling in M plus then the default estimator that M plus uses is maximum likelihood. You can see that here under estimator ML and then Below that, we obtain sample statistics where we can check the observed variable means, covariances, and correlations to make sure everything looks okay and is in line with our expectations. So sometimes it can happen that your data file is not correctly processed by M plus for whatever reason. And so here you would see then if you get, if you get abnormal means or uh, unexpected correlations for the variables, then that um, could be a basic check to make sure everything's okay. So here things seem okay. You can see that the variables that measure the same factor, for example, Y1 and Y2 are highly correlated. Likewise, Y3 and Y4 as indicators of the factor F2 are also highly correlated and that's as it should be. And there are also correlations between the variables that belong to different factors showing that there is a relationship between these two constructs F1 and F2. You also get univariate sample statistics in M plus. You can take a look at the skewness and kurtosis, for example, as well as the minimum and maximum. And 
um, percentiles. And then after that, you should check that you get the message, the model estimation terminated normally and preferably no additional message. Any addi additional message may indicate that there was some sort of estimation problem, maybe an improper solution or some other kind of problem. So ideally we would want to see only this message here that says the model estimation terminated normally and then nothing else. After that is a summary of the model fit with the number of parameters, the log likelihood value, information criteria for model comparisons, a chi-square test of model fit, which here indicates that this model is not rejected. You can see the chi-square value is pretty small, 0.165, one degree of freedom, and the p-value is 0.6847. So this means the null hypothesis that the model is an exact fit in the population here um, is not rejected at an alpha level of 0.05 or significance level of 0.05 because this p-value here is larger than 0.05 and so the model does not have to be rejected. It fits the data well. The RMSEA is given and it's also looking good with a value of zero and CFITLI are 1.0, which also indicates a good fit. We also get the chi-square test of model fit for the baseline model, which is the so-called null model, where M plus assumes that um, variables are not correlated, that the covariances are all zero, and this is used as a baseline or null model to compute the CFI and TLI indices and also to compare to our model chi-square. And so you can see that our model chi-square is a lot better than that null model chi-square. And that's because the relationships, the correlations in our observed data are substantial as we saw previously when we looked at our observed correlations. These are all very substantial sizable correlations that are far away from zero or far greater than zero. And therefore a null model cannot explain these data very well. And as a result, the null or independence model chi-square value is very large and the p-value is very small, meaning that that null model has to be rejected. The standardized root mean square residual also indicates a good fit with a value near zero. So we can conclude that overall the structural equation model fits our data very well. Below M plus gives the unstandardized parameter estimates first under model results. So these are parameter estimates that are not standardized, that are in the raw metric of the variables. And you can see that the first loading on each factor is a fixed parameter, it's fixed to one. So therefore it has no standard error and no p-value because um, this is a fixed parameter that is that needs to be fixed for identification. And the same is true here for Y3, which also has a fixed loading of one. And M plus does this by default to identify the model. So the first factor loading for each factor is always fixed to 1.0 by default in M plus for model identification. The second factor loading is estimated and all other subsequent factor loadings would be estimated if you had more than two indicators. You can see that this one here is 0.978 for the second indicator and the, uh, it's highly significant. So this obviously this variable is strongly related to the factor F1. Now how strongly we cannot tell very well from the unstandardized loadings, but later um, we will take a look at the standardized solution and those standardized loadings are uh, in directly interpretable as correlations between the variable and the factor. Here those are unstandardized loadings, so they are not interpretable as correlations. You can see that also from the fact that um, the loading, the unstandardized loading here of Y4 is above one, which that is not proper for a correlation. So this isn't a correlation and therefore it's fine to have a loading of 1.118 here because it's not in standardized metric. Here under F2 on F1, you find the regression or path coefficient, again, unstandardized for the relationship between the factor F1 and the factor F2. So this indicates to so see that whether there is 
a relationship between f1 and f2, you can see that the coefficient is positive, indicating that um, the two factors are positively correlated. The coefficient is significant, indicating that there is a significant relationship between f2 and f1 here, given this um, significant path or linear regression coefficient. And plus also gives us the intercepts or additive constants for the observed variables for the measurement model. These are typically not of the greatest interest in most analyses unless you have a multi-group analysis or unless you have a longitudinal analysis where you might want to compare the intercepts across groups or across time then usually otherwise they are not so interesting to look at. We also get the estimated factor correlation for the exogenous factor F1. That's also a parameter in the model. And we get the residual variances for the observed variables as well as for our endogenous factor F2. Below are the standardized model results, which many people find more interpretable because now the variables are standardized to a variance of one and that turns these factor loadings here into correlations or makes them interpretable in terms of correlation coefficients. And you can see that these are very strong standardized factor loadings, particularly for the factor F1. For F2, they are maybe slightly lower, at least the first one. And so overall, these are strong standardized factor loadings indicating a high reliability of the indicators as measures of each factor. The standardized path coefficient here is also in this particular case interpretable as a correlation coefficient because here we have a bivariate relationship, a bivariate linear regression between F1 and F2. And so this is a bivariate linear regression coefficient that is standardized and that can be interpreted as a correlation. And it shows you there's a strong correlation between F1 and F2, namely 0.62. Now, if you had more predictor variables of F2, then this coefficient could no longer be interpreted as a correlation if your other predictor variables are correlated with one another. And so this is only because this is just a bivariate regression and therefore we can interpret this um, coefficient here as a um, correlation coefficient. At the very end, you get your R squared values for both the observed dependent variables and the latent dependent variables. In this case, we have four indicators. And so for each of those, we get an R squared. The R squared values in this model are identical to the standardized factor loadings squared because these standardized factor loadings, as I told you earlier, indicate correlations between each variable and the factor. And so then the R squared values are these correlations squared. And so they indicate the reliability between or the reliability of each observed variable as measure of its latent factor. And so here you can see that the reliabilities range between 0.614 and 0.797. So about so between about 61% and 80% of the observed variance is true score variance or reflects true inter-individual differences. And so that shows that these measures are fairly reliable. We also get an R squared value for the latent variable, which here is F2. So F2 is our latent dependent variable. And so we can see that um, 0.3, that R squared is 0.384, which means that 38.4% of the variance in F2 is accounted for by the factor F1 in a linear regression analysis. So there's a pretty um, sizable association between these factors as we saw before the correlation was 0.62 and so this here this r squared is this um, correlation squared in this case and so that results in almost 40 percent of the variance being accounted for in this model i hope you found this video useful to learn about the m plus output file for a structural equation model if you did then please subscribe to this channel and hit the like button and don't forget to check out the description for additional resources. Also feel free to leave a comment in the comment section and I'll see you next time.